composition and design, they, they tend to kind of run together in my opinion. Um, you may notice that these different tree masses that I put in, they're all spaced a particular way. Uh, if it was that way on site, or if it wasn't that way on site, doesn't really matter to me. I'm gonna arrange them in a way that I find interesting. All right, now we're going to get right to our guest, Rich Gallego. Rich, welcome. Thanks, Eric. So today I want to show people that their options are, are almost unlimited, whether they're painting um, plein air or, or from a photo reference. Um, one of the things that I've noticed in, in the many years that I've been teaching uh, landscape painting is a lot of times students want to paint exactly what's in front of them, or they think that they're, they're obligated to paint exactly what's in front of them. When in fact, it's bringing their own artistic sensibilities to the to the piece that actually has a chance of making it art. So, what I'm going to do today is just four diagrammatical sketches, basically, and uh, I'm going to take the same seven elements of a scene, rearrange them in different ways to find which piece uh, has the most is the most interesting, the most dynamic, um, or maybe for the person painting whatever scene they're painting which piece says what they wanted to say, which has the narrative that they wanted to impart to their audience. So let's assume that this upper quadrant over here, that we have a basic landscape where you've got a foreground and you've got maybe a background hill. And a larger set of mountains back here. Now this is actually from a photograph that I took many years ago and that up against this mid-ground hill, there was uh, a tree here, something else there. And it, it actually looked somewhat like this, which is pretty basic, right? Um, so this is your, your foreground. Now, if you see that, and that's, that's actually what occurs in real life, you have the benefit of seeing it firsthand. And your viewers of your paintings, are, they don't have that benefit, so they don't know if that's actually what it looked like, they assume that it does. So my question is, why doesn't the artist look at that and say, how can I arrange, arrange this to make it a bit more interesting? And there are a lot of different options for that. And again, I'm gonna use the same seven elements in sky, background mountain, middle ground hill, three trees or bush bushes and a foreground. I'm gonna use those same elements in each one of these, but just arrange them differently and, and, and change the size to add mass, you know, make it, look like it's closer, make it like it's far, far, pardon me, farther away. So this next one, what if we just said, okay, we're gonna take that horizon line and lower it just a little bit. And then we're gonna put that background hill mass in. And we got the background mountain and the shape of it is not very consequential right now. But with these tree masses, what if instead of having them all below the, the ridge line, what if I took the one over here and said, well, that's closer, so I'm gonna drop it down below the horizon line. And it's large. So I'm gonna make it bigger. And I've got one here that I'm gonna push way back. And then this one here is gonna be a bit bigger too, but I'm not dropping it down below the horizon line. And what that does is it establishes some distance and some depth because this is obviously in the foreground. These two are farther back. The other thing is I've broken the line of the, the mid-ground hill. And I refer to this as something called um, shape containment. Now the actual photograph that I initially worked from it, they were so far back, these tree masses, that they were below this mid-ground ridge line. But if you want to make the painting more interesting, I find that having some variety is best. So if I make this one larger, this one small, this one larger again, that's a little bit of variety right there. And it's helpful. And the other thing is, in bringing this forward, you know, we, we always try to make a painting balance, whether it's from left to right or top to bottom. But too often, people forget to try and balance it foreground to background as well. So if they're all sitting on the horizon line, well, that's all well and good. But doing this, bringing this forward, extends the, the, um, the, the depth 
of the piece. And we, you know, part of our, our goal here is to make the two dimensional look three dimensional. So by bringing this forward, pushing these back, you start to establish this foreground that's, that's coming toward the viewer. Now that's, that's one option. What if in looking and say I'm out on, on location and I'm looking at the scene, what if I say, okay, let's try and make it a little bit more interesting. What if instead of having the horizon line down here, what if I have a high horizon line? All right, now I still have my mid ground hill. Now I'm doing this, what I've done is I've zoomed in, you know, so far back here that now that background mountain, it's gonna have to go off the, the picture plane. Uh, I'm gonna come back and use a, make these value studies so that you'll see it more clearly uh, after a little bit here. And then if I say, okay, I still have these, these tree masses, I can make this one here smaller and push it back to the, the distance. I can make this one over here very, very small. And this one here I can bring forward and have it break the plane of not just the, the mid ground here, but go up into the sky area. And now what we have here is, and again, you know, this is a ground plane. Now what we have here is a tree that broke the horizon line. It's, it's you know, rooted in the, the extreme foreground and it's broken the horizon line and the ridge line of the mid ground hill. We've got this background mountain going off the, the, the painting completely. And what it does is it says that this is all way, you know, a lot further back. And the way that we imply depth and distance, there are several ways to do it. Uh, and it all ties into composition. Um, one of them is overlapping masses, which this cl tree clearly does here. Uh, and this here, you can't quite tell because it's not as high, but the other ways that we imply depth and distance is, you know, um, cool things recede, warm things advance, um, diminution of form, meaning making things smaller as they go back into the distance. Um, the, the, uh, the level of contrast lessens as you go into the depth. In other words, the shadows and lights, there's less difference between them as you go into the, the distance. So we'll use other means to imply all that depth as we go into the painting. But just setting up the shapes, again, we have the same seven shapes, ground plane, three tree masses, two hill masses, and a sky. Now this one over here, let's try something different. What if our landform isn't quite, quite horizontal? This diagonal, even though it's somewhat of a, you know, a slight diagonal, it, it imparts a little bit more of a dynamic feel to it because everything else is at right angles, meaning the edges of the, of the, the painting. Now, if we then, again, mid-ground hill, and let's bring the, the mountain in from the other side, the one that's in the distance. And we've got a tree mass here. Let's put it in the foreground. Let's make it large again. And again, folks, this, these aren't intended to be finished paintings. I'm just trying to show you diagrammatically some of the options that one has. And then we've got our other tree mass here. And one that's forward of that, but not in front of this one. And, you know, so you get the sense that they're really almost unlimited options. And, and therein lies the point. When you go to paint, whether it's from a photo reference or whether you're doing plein air painting, this is the use of thumbnails that, you know, students are often told to do thumbnail sketches, but they're not always told why. And I, I've seen students of mine do a thumbnail and all they're doing is drawing everything that they see. But the purpose of it is to start editing a scene and say, you know, what is it that I like about this scene? What is it that supports the narrative that I'm trying to, to impart on the viewer? And so to do that, you have to edit out certain things that are extraneous. You have to sort of magnify the things that are important, whether that's focusing, you know, zeroing in on them or just making them larger. Uh, there, there are all kinds of ways to do it or contrast. But if you don't think about all the possible options before you start to paint, well, all you're doing is copying a scene. And, you know, that's a normal stop on the, the continuum to learning how to paint the landscape. But at some point you want to go past that and do something that's that's more interesting. 
So, you know, I tell my students all the time to think of everything that's in the landscape as reference material. You don't have to stick to exactly what's there. Uh, in fact, sometimes that's not very interesting. Um, John Carlson in his book on landscape painting, his, I believe it's called Guide to Landscape Painting. Um, he has a line in there where he says that, you know, that God doesn't just drop, and I'm paraphrasing, doesn't just, you know, drop out perfect landscapes for the, and I love this phrase, luxurious darlings to, to but stoop over and pick up. And what he's saying is, look, you don't go out there and find the perfect composition every time you go outside to paint. You have to work for it. You have to see what's there, use it to your, your best possible advantage. And that's what I'm trying to impart here is to get people to look at one scene. All of these have the same seven elements in them, right? Hill form, mountain form, sky, land form, a foreground rather, and then three bushes or trees. They're all the same in that respect, but they're all completely different. So, hey, Rich. Yeah, sure. I think what would be a really great thing for everybody to try is to do a grid like that in their sketchbook and, and force themselves to come up with four versions before they decide what their composition is going to be. Because after, you know, the original one I thought was, well, it was pretty nice. But when, once you did the other stuff, it was like, wow, much, much changed, much different. And I don't know if, if people have a preference of which one they like, A, B, C, or D. Uh, you can put that in the comments if you'd like. But uh, I think all of them make great paintings and uh, also gives you an opportunity if you want, you can do uh, more than one painting on location. So you can say, okay, now I'm going to try it with this composition. So are you going to then get into a value study and show how darks and lights impact distance? Yeah, absolutely. And you're, you're completely correct about that. That's, that's kind of the whole point here is to let people know, look, you got to go out there and figure out what options are available to you instead of just painting exactly what's in front of you. Um, so, and these are just four options. Like I said, there, there are a lot more depending on what scene you're looking at. Um, and everybody has a different artistic aesthetic. So different, you know, different ones, uh, examples are going to appeal to different people. Um, the other thing is if you have a specific uh, narrative that you're trying to impart, one of them might fit it better. So it's not to say that this is better than this or, you know, any of the others. It's to say, look at your options, find the one that you like the best and it fits your needs best. Yeah, so we're gonna go ahead and finish these up as value studies so you can get a better idea of how they work. Um, and, you know, composition is tied into so much else in painting. So this is uh, kind of important stuff anyway. So if you're gonna establish distance and depth, we have to recognize that verticals in general, there are exceptions, but in general, verticals tend to be darker especially if they're fairly close. So I'm just gonna go through all four of these and try and establish the relative value that I need. A great way to think about this, everybody, is that think of uh, three planes. One is, let's say it's a Coke can standing straight up. Uh, that is not catching a lot of light because it is, um, unless the light is coming from behind you. Uh, so it's going to be darker. It might be lighter on the top. Now, imagine uh, the roof of a house, which is a triangle or a, an angle that's catching a little bit more light, but it's not as light as the sky. That would be what happens on mountains. Of course, if a mountain is in the far distance, it's going to be even lighter. And then uh, as things come forward, they get darker and typically warmer. Uh, as things recede, yellow tends to go away. And as a result, that, um, that gets cooler and, um, and uh, some, of the, some of the blues kind of disappear. All right, Rich. Yeah, Eric, you're exactly right. There, it, that's the um, the idea. The angle of the light hitting the land, it it has a huge influence. Uh, and so those diagonal hillsides, and they are situated diagonal diagonally. If you're thinking three dimensionally, they're just reflecting the light in a different way than uh, than say the ground, which is at a you know essentially at a right angle to the the source of the light, which is the sun. So forgive me, folks, these aren't, like I said, finished paintings. I'm 
just try to get them roughed in here in the time we have so that you'll have an idea of what the concept is. So as we go into the distance with these, they do get lighter. And there's a lot of things that happen as you get into the distance. Your edges typically get softer. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the, uh, the contrast becomes less. So your darks get lighter and your lights get darker, that sort of thing. The color becomes somewhat dis desaturated. And we want to use all of those tools to make uh, something two-dimensional look three-dimensional. So And you can see that you know these dark trees in, in front of the other shapes, because they're so dark, they are coming forward. By the way, there are times when I'll start students off with painting landscape, even out in plein air, I'll have them start with value studies like this, because the value, you know, the old adage that color gets all the attention and value does all the work, and it's absolutely true in my opinion. Uh, if uh, if your you can make a perfectly right, beautiful painting with just one color. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, look at somebody like Charlie Hunter, who, you know, he does things that are. You know, fairly monochromatic a lot of the time. And yeah, you, and it doesn't even really matter what the color is sometimes. If you get those values nailed, you can do a beautiful piece. The other thing that, you know, as far as composition, and, and composition and design, they, they tend to kind of run together, in my opinion. Um, you may notice that these different tree masses that I put in they're all spaced a particular way. Uh, if it was that way on site, or if it wasn't that way on site, doesn't really matter to me. I'm going to arrange them in a way that I find interesting. And um, I want to just that, I want to point out what just happened there. Rich just did a test shot, right? He yeah. laid down a stroke, realized yeah. it was too dark, and uh, and then he lightened it. Yeah. The beautiful thing about oil paint <laughs> or oil painting is that it's uh, very forgiving. You can do things like that to see if you're in the ballpark and if you can have to scrape it off, you can do that. If not, you can go right into it sometimes like I did there. Ken Grody is asking what you're painting on. Oh, this is just a, a canvas covered board. Yeah, I like I like um, boards rather than stretched canvas if I can do it because I, when I do the block ends, I tend to scrub in pretty hard and pretty rough on them. And um, well, and if you're painting outside, a canvas is like a sail. Absolutely, and they're just too bulky to be traveling around with. Rich, I want to encourage everybody uh, to make sure they leave a comment, tell us where they're from. You have a chance to win a subscription to Pl uh, Fine Art Connoisseur Magazine. We have people watching from Poland, Mumbai, Turkey, New Zealand, and probably other places that they haven't put it in the comments yet. So get busy, guys. Uh, how cool is that? I love that you have such a huge audience. Yeah, so when I, when I look at the spacing of objects, and this is another another topic, so I won't go too deeply into it right here. But the idea of asymmetric rhythms is something that I'm really big on as well. And Eric, do you mind if I mention um, a social media platform that I'm involved with that some people might not be real familiar with? Go for it. Yeah, I, there's a there's a platform called Locals.com, and um, I've got a. A subscription page on there but there are some free videos as well and basically it's a lot of uh instructional videos but they're they're um shorter usually they're seven to ten minutes in length so for people that don't have three hours to sit and watch start to finish um and it, they tackle you know, much like we're doing today different aspects of painting in each video so there's one for this sort of thing there's one about asymmetric rhythms and spacing of objects and um, edges and you know all the different aspects of painting so if right. you want to go to locals.com and look up my page, which is called Artscapes, um, you might find something that you like there. Thank you, Rich. No, thank you. 
Now, okay, I want to. I just want to ask you a question. From from my perspective, looking through the screen, those three trees are about the same value. Yeah, they are. There are so there are different ways of establishing depth and distance. Now, I've got these on here now. The next thing that I would do is everything has to do with relative value. So if I look at this tree here and what is behind it, because this needs to be lightened so that it sits back from this one, um, I will, but I, it has to be still darker than this hillside. So this is where I start balancing your, your values. And, and I don't mean making them balanced across the painting, but you start making a little lighter so that it relates properly to what's behind it, to what's you know in another part of the painting. So now that I've got that there, and I have a tendency to paint things sometimes darker than they need to be at the start. Remember, this is basically a block in. So if I block them in too darkly, that's not a problem because with oil, it's easier to lighten up. And I'm gonna go into all of these things eventually and paint you know, over them to a degree. You can also just take your paper towel and wipe some things back. That's true. That's true. So my task, if I'm going to say, if I was to finish this piece right here, my task would be to make sure that, that I find it the exact proper value. It should be dar darker than this hill mass, but lighter than this tree over here. And that starts to approximate there. And then the other thing is, normally I would be doing, you know, a full painting, not just the value study. So the, the temperature difference would also help push that, that, uh, that tree back into the distance a bit more. Okay. If you guys are digging this, make sure you leave a like or thumbs up, a comment, anything. Appreciate it. Okay, so there's, as Carlson describes, basically four planes of light. And they are the sky, which is the source of the light, the ground planes, or anything that's at a you know a right angle to the light. It might be the top of a tree, something like that. But usually we're talking about the ground plane. So that's going to be light. It's going to be lighter than everything but the sky. Now, mind you guys, obviously there's going to be other information that's put into a full painting, but remember that the purpose of this was to show you that there are a lot of different options. So if we look at this one right here, the sky, the sky shape is the lightest. That's the source of the light. This is a bit lighter than this here, and it's considerably lighter than everything else. So that's the second lightest that's reflecting light straight up. Then the diagonals, remember these mountains and hillsides, they are diagonal. And there are other things that I would do in a finished painting, such as, warm up the base of this so it comes forward a little bit but just in terms of shapes and values lightest second lightest uh these diagonal forms are the next but this one is way back so it's going to be even lighter and then the verticals as eric was describing earlier with the can verticals are you know especially if they're if it's contra you know with the light behind it um they're going to be the darkest now that of course you're going to find you know light the highlights and dark accents if you're finishing the painting, but that's that's not for today. So I basically am going to go through and do the same with all of these. And Eric, I don't know how much time we have. I'll, I'll work on that. And um, you got a little time. OK, good. Good. And if anybody has any questions, please feel free to ask. That's kind of why we're here. All right. I'll, I'll uh, read them if you ask them, guys. Now, do you want to touch on uh, warmth and cool in, in creating atmosphere? Because everything you're painting here is a relatively cool color. Yeah, well, this, I'm using um, basically one color plus white. This is a, a Daniel Smith uh, color called raw umber violet. Um, and yeah, if I'm going to, again, if I'm doing a, a painting, I'm concerned with temperature. This was just to demonstrate the, the compositional options that people have. Um, but I would it's certainly like you're making it a little darker in the ground as you get a little closer. Is that right? So th that is right. And that goes to where my focal area is. Say I wanted a focal point that was right up here. I want to find ways to, to focus the eye there. So if I decided, well, I want a slash of light right here and say, I take some of this off to create a slash of light on the ground. 
Come on off of there. My gambling or my gam salts taking time to dissolve. So if I wanted to make a highlight right up there somewhere, it makes sense that I should try and maybe put some shadows in the grasses that are here because it funnels the eye toward the light. Our, you know, we say our eye, but it's really our brain seeks certain things. And one of them is light. So what I would tend to do in a finished piece is put more light here, probably a bit more chroma around here than other parts of the painting, maybe some sharper edges. Um, anything I can do to enhance the idea to, to get people to go to that particular spot. Now, design is another aspect of it. And if, if I'm designing it well, I'm going to have them stop at different places along the way. So that it's not just a beeline to right there, because then they're done looking at the painting, basically. I might put a little bit of a dark grass over here. Just to give something for the eye to go to, maybe another something over here. So that instead of going straight this way, the eye kind of goes from here to there, back this way to some darks that might be over here, and then to the light over here. That way, the the the, uh, the root is going back and forth, and it takes some time for them to get there. So yeah, I would darken the foreground just a bit. You don't want to create so much contrast that there's so much visual weight there that the eye can't get away from it. Um, But again, that, that in my mind, that goes more to design. And, you know, there, I tell people that painting is relative. It's the values and how they relate. But it's also, you know, there's not one concept that's divorced from all the others. They all kind of have to work together. So design and composition are very closely related in my If thinking. you guys just tuned in, our guest today is Rich Gallego, and uh, he's working on composition. Have you considered the different options of composition? And uh, we have a prize for you today. If you leave a comment and we pick your name, you get a subscription to Fine Art Connoisseur Magazine Digital Edition. The winner of our last prize, which was Plein Air Magazine, is Sandy Singer in Atlanta, Georgia. We have a free gift for you. It's 240 Plein Air painting tips. Just go to pleinairlive.com slash 240. And if you want to subscribe to this, uh, just go to Streamline Art on YouTube hit the subscribe and notifications bell and uh, go to uh, Eric Rhodes on Instagram and follow. Thank you. All right, Rich, keep going. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and develop this one a little bit more in the time that we have. I personally kind of like this one just because I like the diagonals that are in it. It seems a bit more dynamic to me. Angles sure make a difference, but, but flat, uh, horizontals make for peaceful. This is true. Yeah. Which is kind of goes into whether we're using a vertical, you know, a portrait format or a landscape format. Do you want there to be tension or do you want there to be, um, you know, serenity? And again, th those are things that go into the decision as to which composition one wants to use. So I'm all for energy, baby. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh, what are we doing here? I'm going to warm up this ground plane. And folks, you know, early on, all this blocking stuff has been very thinly painted, which means that I can get thicker paint and put layers on and, and warm it up. And uh, again, but I, but the, the warmth that I put on here is basically the same value that I initially put down. So that'll work fine. Um, If I want, I don't want a dark red tree necessarily right now. Although there are times when that's appropriate. So I'm going to go into this dark with some chromatic black and cad lemon so that I can get a, a dark green. So again, once you do this, this value study, you know, this is kind of your map. You just add color but keep the same value plan. And I'm not concerned right now with highlights or anything like that. That'll all come later. In fact, I kind of think of that as a payoff for doing the, all the groundwork right. So I, I make myself wait till the end for some of these things as sort of a reward. Okay, now. 
can get some color in that sky. What are you using as a medium to glaze with? Oh, um, this is just um, gambling solvent free gel medium. And, you know, again, I said a few minutes ago, I tend to paint a little darker than I need to initially because I know that I'm going to go into the various areas of the painting again and lighten them up. So as I'm blocking in, say, this sky shape, you know, it's it's a particular color and value, but I would never leave a sky <laughs> just one solid color and value. I always go in with you know, some other values reflecting the light coming off the surface of the earth. And um, I never paint any any color without a little bit of its complement. So at some point, there's going to be some very pale orange introduced into this sky. I want to point out that look what happened to that tree just because you left that little edge there. You didn't touch it. Now it's got a glow on top. Yeah, because your highlights got to go somewhere. <laughs> yeah, um, thanks for pointing that out, Eric, because it's it's... It's something that people ask about a lot when they see me doing these demos. I do tend to leave, you see it here as well, I tend to leave a little space between each shape. And that's because, for instance, on this tree, when I come back and put some of the light that's hitting it on the top, uh, now I've got sort of a, a clean area to put that paint in. I don't have to worry about it being um, compromised by you know mixing with some of the other paint. Even though at some point I'm going to do that as well, if I lay on... Let me just show you right now, since we're talking about it. If I get a, a, a sunlit green, I can come straight in here and lay that on. And I don't have to worry about it mixing too much with the other colors. And again, I'm going to keep getting thicker and thicker with the paint as I proceed. But this way, there's some place for a pure color to go on. And then when I'm ready, I can come back in and I can mix some of it so that it looks more organic and that sort of thing. And then nice. toward the end, I'll come on with some really thick stuff for the, for the brightest highlights and really just lay it on top um, instead of pushing it into the earlier layers at all. You guys get that? That was phenomenal. I like being the interpreter. <laughs> so all of these forms where they face the sun most directly that's where the light is bouncing off of them the most and so you want to warm them a bit and lighten them a bit and if i've got this hill this this mid-ground hill mass eh? the same sort of thing if I come back here and throw some light on it and I won't, don't want to do it everywhere because then it looks too contrived but once that's there then I can start kind of blending it down a little bit if I need to now in other in order to make that stand out a bit more I could very well go behind to the next mountain and darken something at the base of it so that that sunlit ridge of the, of the mid-ground hill will, will sort of pop forward. If you guys are enjoying this and you think others would enjoy the, the lesson in this, make sure you hit share so that other people get the benefit of learning what Rich has to teach. And what again, are you doing there? So I want this mid-ground hill to... to to pop forward a little bit after I put some light on it. So I'm going back behind the light that I put on there onto the other mountain mass and adding a little bit of dark. And then I'm gonna blend it in a little bit. And this is an ongoing thing. You just keep working the lights and darks, but I don't want it to get so dark that it comes, comes Hello, forward. Hello, India. Pardon me? Oh, I was just saying hello to India. Someone oh. else, uh, Sirindar. Uh, tuned in from India. Oh, very nice. And then to what Eric was saying earlier, these are, they're still fairly dark. 
so in order to get that depth, I don't want just values. I want temperatures as well. So assuming these are some, some, you know, similar to this sort of tree, whatever type of tree we're using here, I want similar color, but I don't want it to be as, uh, as saturated as chromatic. And I don't want it as warm. So I'll mix a green from the same stuff that I used to make this. And I'll add a little bit of blue and lighten a little bit so that it, it cools off. And that'll help it sit back. And then when I go to add a highlight to that, same thing. I'll, I'll add some blue to it to keep it a bit cooler. And this is perhaps a little, a little extreme, but I want it to show up here. So th this greenish color here is a lot cooler than that one is there. So remember earlier I said that we established depth and distance. There's a series of things that you can do. Overlapping of forms, diminution of size, meaning things getting smaller as they go back. Uh, contrast, you know, the value range becomes compressed between light and shadow, this dark, and this light are much farther apart on the, on the value scale than this light and this dark here. So that helps as well. And then softening edges does the same thing. So this is the sort of thing that I would be doing to all of these uh, to finish them up. And the thing is, you know, to get an idea, say I have a plein air piece that I, I did and I'm not sure which composition I wanna use in the studio for a larger piece. This is a quick way, relatively quick way. I can do all of these in probably, I don't know, an hour, hour and a half, and get them to a, a point of completion that's not suitable for framing, certainly, but it's good enough that I can look at them and figure out which of these I think is the most compelling picture. And then if I want to do, you know, an 18 by 24, just one of these, then I know which one I want to use. So this is kind of the process that I use a lot of the time when I when I paint outdoors. I'll do a small 8 by 10, maybe 9 by 12. And then I'll come back to the studio and do multiples like this to figure out which one I want to turn into that 30 by 40 studio piece. Nice. Yeah. But again, folks, the, the main thing I wanted to get across today was don't just go out and paint exactly what's in front of you. Look at what's there. See how you can arrange it to make the most compelling piece that you can paint. Um, and that's that's when you introduce your own um, your own intrinsic artistry to a piece. It's not just copying a scene. Uh, it's it's putting part of who you are into the painting. Okay, and Richard, uh, on camera here, I want you to raise your right hand. <laughs> and and I want e everybody in the audience to raise your right hand. And by the way, I can see you, so I know if you're doing it. And Linda Marie Crabb, you're not doing it yet. <laughs> Case Neva, I can see you're not doing it yet. Right hand, everybody. Get that right hand up. All right, right hand. Here we go. Wait a minute. I got to get on screen here. All right right hand. And that is when I go out and I do a study in the field and I do a sketch, I am going to do four different sketches, four different compositions so I can pick the best one. Everybody, you'll do it. Yes. I promise. <laughs> All right. I know you'll do it. <laughs> well, Rich, this has been absolutely fabulous. Everybody is saying, you know, you need to do a streamlined video. Everybody says you're a great teacher you're patient and you explain Thanks, things well. So thank you so much. This has been very valuable. I would encourage everyone watching to hit the share button because the more you share it, the more Rich gets a lot of love and I get a little myself and that never hurts. Uh, Rich, we are excited about having you at the plein air convention and Can't you wait. heard the news, right? Yeah, I did. Very yeah, happy That's big. It. That's <laughs> big. Now, you have been to the plein air convention before many times, I think originally maybe the first one yep. and um, tell everybody what that experience is like from your perspective. Cause when I tell them, they don't believe me. Yeah. You know, I, I've run into folks who, who think, Oh, you're just saying that cause you're going to be there. And look folks, the first time I went, I went as a, you know, a painter that just was excited like everybody else. And, um, Eric didn't know who I was. I wasn't on the faculty. I went there and I met so many other people with the same passion that I have for painting the landscape. Um, 
I've developed a network of friends based on that first convention that, you know, that's basically the biggest gift that, that painting in general has given me is the, the friends that I've made and, and that I continue to, you know, cultivate those friendships. But there's so much information from some of the top painters in the country, sometimes from out of the country. You're going to learn from the instructors. You're going to learn from the demos, from the lectures. You're going to learn from other painting, painters out in the field. That's the other thing. I, I was impressed that there's a lot of people that come there that nobody knows who they are, but because they've been, you know, reading Planner Magazine, they've been coming to the conventions, they've been watching the videos, they've gotten to be really, really good. Um, but the biggest thing for me is the sharing of information and, you know, the idea that you're, you're there with people who have the same passion that you do. The camaraderie is amazing. And by the way, the places we're going to be painting, I've been to all of them before. Um, the phenomenal places to paint. I mean, Eric's really setting us up for a win when you go to paint at, you know, El Rancho de los Galandrinas or, or uh, Sanctuario de Chamayo, Ghost Ranch. These places are, it's hard to do a bad painting there. <laughs> so, well, you know, well, then there's me. <laughs> no, <laughs> Eric's being too modest. I painted next to him at, at uh, what was it, El Rancho de los Galandrinas, I believe. Oh. And uh, yeah, he's, he's being modest, folks. All right. Well, thank you for the shameless self-promotion and I'll send your dollar bill in the mail. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, that Rich. Works. Thanks again for being on today. It's a pleasure to have you. Everybody can visit Rich's website, which is in the comments. Scroll back up. We put it in there. Um, I want to thank all the people who've been watching. Uh, we, we, I never shout out on all the people in the U S cause there's so many hundreds of you, but I do shout out on the people coming from other countries today. I saw Poland, Mumbai, Turkey, New Zealand, Dubrovnik, that's new, and England. So thank you for everyone for tuning in. And uh, the rest of you who are tuning in and not saying where you're from, shame, shame, shame. All right. And we are really thrilled to have you here. Rich, thank you so much. Okay.